Romans chapter 14, verses 1 through 13. Receive one who is weak in the faith, but not to disputes over doubtful things. For one believes he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats only vegetables. Let not him who eats despise him who does not eat, and let not him who does not eat judge him who eats, for God has received him. Who are you to judge another's servant to his own master? He stands or falls. Indeed, he will be made to stand, for God is able to make him stand. One person esteems one day above another. Another esteems every day alike. Let each be fully convinced in his own mind. He who observes the day observes it to the Lord. And he who does not observe the day to the Lord, he does not observe it. He who eats, eats to the Lord and he gives God thanks. And he who does not eat to the Lord, he does not eat and gives God thanks. For none of us lives to himself and no one dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord And if we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and rose and lived again that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. Then verse 10. But why do you judge your brother? Or why do you show contempt for your brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us shall give an account of himself to God. Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather resolve this, not to put a stumbling block or cause to fall in our brother's way. Here in this portion of scripture here in the book of Romans, Paul talks about questionable things, things that make you go, hmm, is that okay for a believer to do that? Uh, Should I do that or should I not do that? And we're going to take two weeks unpacking this passage of Scripture. Today, the focus in the opening verses is on the freedom that we have to worship. The freedom that God has given every believer to walk out his walk in the way that he finds conviction before the Lord to do so. This may look differently from one to another. We may have differing convictions. We might have different things that we abstain from as we walk through this life. Other things that we partake of. And the Bible here is just telling us that in this, that in this, that we should not necessarily put our convictions on another Christian. If we have a liberty to do so, they may not have a liberty to do so. And we shouldn't despise them or look down on them if they don't have the same liberty we have. Or if somebody has a liberty that you do not have, you shouldn't judge them or pass judgment on them as though they're sinning just because they're, they're doing something that you don't think is necessarily right for you. And so here in this portion of scripture, we see there's a couple of thoughts. And first today I said, we'll talk about being free to worship. Next week, the focus will be more on our guard to not cause others to stumble or that we are free to serve others, free to love others. So as we've been studying through the book of Romans, remember, we've said this, the gospel is not a one-time message to be believe, believed, but it's a lifetime message to be embraced. And we've considered the great news of the gospel in the book of Romans. The latter part of the book of Romans is our walking out of that. So what does Paul have in mind here? Remember he said in Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, where he he declared that we should now live our lives in light of God's great truth. We should live our lives as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to the Lord. And so as we live our lives, they're lives of worship. And we don't all worship the same way, do we? Even when we worship in song, it's not all the same. When we were singing this morning, we actually sang a song, uh, Lift My Hands High to You, that, that portion of that song. And I opened my eyes during that time to see how many people had their hands raised. It was about 50%, even though we were saying, having a song. So, and then on songs when we were not singing about having my hands lifted high, it's even less than that. But are you more spiritual or less spiritual to have your hands raised? Well, you know, as we'll see today, it's not neither one or the other. It's more a matter of the heart. But... If you desire to be a little more demonstrative in worship, 
um, I can offer you some great help from the Christian theologian and comedian, Tim Hawkins, okay? <laughs> so, so he, you know, he's been I mean, so instrumental in the church this way. So maybe you're a little nervous, you want to start raising your hands in church, but you're just, you're just not quite there yet. Well, he suggests we could, here's, he's, he's named all the different worship motions, and you could start this way, just with a little elbow flap, okay? <laughs> Gets the heart, heart moving. And then from there, if you're so bold, you can go to carry the TV. <laughs> Out from there, widescreen, okay? And then, here, my fish was this big. My fish was that big. You're really getting into it. And then hold my baby, hold my baby. You can go from that to Mufasa and goalposts, okay? And then you can go from goalposts to heartburn, back to goalposts, you know, double heartburn. Goal posts, okay. <laughs> then there's always, um, there's uh, what, there's, there's pointer finger, a hatchet, and uh, classroom. <laughs> and then from classroom, like high five, giving God a high five there, right? And then a lot of ladies like wash the window. <laughs> okay, and then from there you can go to the, the big three, which is village people, uh, Rocky, and touchdown, right? <laughs> or touchdown, okay. Yeah, Tim Hawkins, folks, Tim Hawkins, all right. The idea is we all don't worship the same way. There's freedom in your worship. You have freedom to live your life as a living sacrifice to the Lord. You have freedom to live that life as the Lord convicts you and leads you in liberties and in, in abstaining alike. But you are free to worship because the Lord accepts you. Here's the big thought today. The Lord accepts you on the basis of the gospel, not on the basis of your worship. There's freedom in our expression because he's told us he'll receive us on the basis of what he's done for us. Not what we've done for him or how we're expressing our gratitude toward him. And because of that, we shouldn't judge one another, nor should we look down on each other. And we shouldn't try to make the church one big cookie cutter conformed group that worships the same way, abstains from the same things, and shares the same liberties. That any time in any one local body, we should have people with varying persuasions and backgrounds. And we live together, worshiping the one Lord in the manner in which he's called us to. And so the big idea in these opening verses of Romans 14 are, receive one another because the Lord has received you on the basis of the gospel. Verse, four, verse 1 of chapter 14 says, Receive one who is weak in the faith, but not to disputes over doubtful things. You see Paul's big heart, can't you, at the start, in the first verse, verse first word, receive. That word means welcome or accept into the fold. Somebody who is a newer or immature believer. And as you welcome them in and you accept them, don't accept them so that you can immediately argue with them and tell them why they need to grow up in that area and they need to start doing this and stop doing that, but receive them and give them time to grow. What if they've come from a Catholic background and they still pray with the crucifix? Or what if they've come from a pretty rugged background and some of the clothing that they wear kind of still says that they, they're immature? We accept them in, but what if they have come from a legalistic background and they are so connected to this thing that they, they, they just can't bring their conscience to do things any differently for them to not do this thing that you have a liberty to do would mean that they would feel very bad about themselves and it might lead them to sin in other ways. We'll talk about not causing our brother to stumble next week, but first let's just consider that we have liberty in the church. I think maybe very helpful for us would be 
to define what Paul says here in verse 1 as doubtful things. What does he mean, doubtful things? Well, just even in his own text, it's helpful as he goes on to talk about it. Verse 2, he helps us very much by understanding what he means by doubtful things because he talks about food. For one believes he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats only vegetables. Okay? And then he goes down to say um, in verse 6 about observing a day. So we're talking about external things, about food that, that we're eating or when we worship or how we worship and, and those sorts of things. But we could maybe sum up this, this thought of doubtful things this way. These are disagreements or differing opinions among Christians regarding areas of sanctification, holiness, worship, that the Bible does not clearly command nor forbid. So obviously the Bible forbids lying, stealing, adultery. So we're not talking about like, well, do I have the liberty as a Christian to commit adultery? No, you don't have the liberty as a Christian to commit adultery. You've been commanded to be holy, but what does it mean to be holy? Does that mean you don't go to this show, but you can watch that one? This sitcom is okay, but that one's not. This food is okay, but this one isn't. And, and there's no line drawn in the church, right? And so these doubtful things, in the first century, there was a big question about meat. Meat that was sold in the meat market, because during that time, in Gentile cities, much of that meat was offered to idols when it was butchered. And so now this meat has been offered to idols, and now you could imagine a new Christian coming into the church in Paul's day, who used to be an idolater, and would eat this meat after it had been sacrificed to an idol, and now they're, they're a brand new Christian, now they want to worship the Lord, and they've turned their back on those old idols, and somebody says, here's a piece of meat, and you say, well, was it sacrificed to Zeus? Like, like, can I eat it or not? And Paul says mature believers would realize that false gods are false gods. They're not actually alive. So they're not in the meat. So you can eat the meat because it's just meat. I've been saved by the Lord. And my understanding of what Jesus did for me in the gospel is so robust and so mature now that I can eat meat. It doesn't matter whether I eat it. I can leave it, take it or leave it. But a new believer can have a real hang up on that. And they say, oh, if I eat that meat then I might as well just sacrifice to the idols itself. And then Paul goes on to talk about days. And certainly in the first century, there was also a big question about do the new Gentile Christians, should they eat according to the Old Testament dietary laws and avoid pork and bacon and shrimp? Or should they, or can they, uh, and should they worship on the Sabbath and keep all of the Jewish feasts? Or are we free to worship on Sunday now, the day that the Lord rose? And, and all of these questions. And sometimes new believers, especially from a Jewish background, had a hard time giving up some of those old traditions and religions. And so Paul says, these are, these are doubtful things. But what are, how do they play out in the church today? What are some of the doubtful things? Well, some of these are archaic, I know. Like maybe in the 1960s or 50s or 60s, the church would have hang-ups about like, can you play cards? How many of you been on a missions trip with, with Calvary Bozeman? We play cards. It's called ding-along. You know, it's the church Calvary game, right? Uh, or can you go to the show even, even go there? Or, or can a Christian dance? Or can a Christian wear jewelry? Or could a Christian woman wear makeup? And then J. Vernon McGee said, well, if the barn needs painting, paint it. <laughs> J. Vernon said that. Anyway, so... Uh, but what about, <laughs> there was a time the Christian church had hangups about tattoos. And I know some still might, but that ship sailed. Now I think more Christians have tattoos than don't. And uh, your favorite Bible verse plastered somewhere. But these are things that you could still have a deep conviction that, no, I don't want to do that to my body. And somebody has a deep conviction that they, they do. And we can still differ on some of these things. What about drinking alcohol? The scripture forbids drunkenness. But the Bible does not forbid drinking alcohol, and that's, that's one where Christians have differing opinions on that today. What about smoking? Can a Christian smoke? And that's, that's one I think that generally we say, no, they shouldn't. And, but then we use the Bible verse because the body's the temple of the Holy Spirit. And, and, and so we'd realize that we, we use Scripture to bolster our convictions. We search it out. Well, these aren't just careless or haphazard things. But we're like, this is what the scripture says, and I'm going to take that, and I'm going to fully believe that. And, and so I say, the, the body's a temple of the Holy Spirit, so you shouldn't smoke or you shouldn't vape, but is it okay to eat fast food? And so you're like, oh, 
or drink two pots of coffee a day. You know, I don't know. And so it's like the, the, we have these things. And, and so we realized, yeah, the scripture tells us to be holy, but it doesn't measure it all out for us. The scripture tells us to be sober, but it doesn't tell us not to drink. And so there's liberties. What about homeschool versus public school versus Christian school? And these are things that Christians have developed deep convictions on. And so this is why we believe this is right for our family. But I also believe there's, there's liberty that God could actually convince you equally and likewise that, that you could go a different direction with these things. And you have freedom to worship. And so, so what is allowed and what is not allowed and what should we do and what should we not do? Well, Micah 6, 8 is very clear. He has shown you, O oh man, what is good and what the Lord requires of you. No NC-17. No, and no, th- no it's, there's not a list that comes here. It's to do good. It's to, to love mercy. It's to walk humbly with your God. And so also notice there in verse 1, Paul says, Let's not have disputes over these doubtful things. The word dispute here is very important for us to understand. It means to make a division or even to make a decision. A church, especially from church leadership, they should not offer a unilateral, universal decision about these doubtful things. Passed down from the pulpit should not be commands about personal liberties. In fact, Paul is saying, receive one another. And a healthy church should have people of varying persuasions. We shouldn't only be a a homeschool church. We shouldn't only be a public school church. We should have believers from both camps that have equal conviction. And I'm not saying willy-nilly or doesn't really matter. I'm not saying we even say, it doesn't really matter what you do. I'm saying, no, this is my conviction. Like, this is my conviction over my dead body. Like, this is how I believe the Lord's ordered and structured my life. But you can also have equal conviction in another area, and we can both be fully convinced in our own mind, and and that's because God receives us. So don't dispute, don't divide, and don't decide. When I was a child, the church I attended to tended toward legalism. And when legalism is passed down from top down, it can really be a problem. Um, Our church wasn't so legalistic that they couldn't have a bowling league, so they uh, joined the bowling league, so they bowled. And they won a trophy, I guess some good bowlers there. And then the church trophy, they, what's the, because of the second command, what's the second command, by the way? Go ahead, just shout it out. Yeah, I was confident. Okay. You shall have no graven images, right? So because of the second image, a second commandment, they said you can't have a graven image. So the bowling guy had to be taken off of the top of that trophy. And then they universally and unilaterally said to the whole church, if you have any trophy at your house, it's a graven image. You can keep the wood portion of it. But the guy has to be removed, the graven image. And I was in fifth grade, and I had a a football trophy and a participation trophy. I didn't do anything special. Uh, And I remember not being able to get to bed that night because I had a graven image in the room. And 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 so at that point, it actually became sin for me because I had been taught that it was wrong. And so in order to have a clean conscience, I just was wrestling with the Lord. It's like, I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. But he's like, well, is that more important to, to you than, than, than me? And be, in order to honor the Lord, I remember getting up and just taking the guy off, snapping it off. And for years after, my friends would come by, like, what happened to your trophy? <laughs> and then, then it was equally hard because I'd say I was just honoring God. Like, I can't have a graven image. And that's not the gospel. And it hindered my walk with the Lord. 
didn't help it. And, and, and it was a misrepresentation of the gospel. And if that's your conviction, you don't want to have a trophy in your house, fine. But don't put that on somebody. And when it gets to the place of leadership, putting that on folks, it can create real trouble within the church. But Paul's point here is on leadership. And when Paul did talk about leaders doing these sorts of things, he got hot under the collar. And he'd say, some tell you to observe days and weeks and seasons and years. And I am afraid for you. And he would say, I wish these guys would even cut themselves off. And he was firm when leaders did this sort of thing. But what he said, when a new believer comes in and has a hang up and, and thinks, oh, I can't do this anymore, that you're to accept them, receive them. Don't despise them and look down on them. And, and that's what Paul says there in verse 3. He says, let not him who eats or those that have the liberty despise him who does not eat and let not him who does not eat judge him who eats for the reason being for God has received him. Do you notice the actions are different but also are, are the heart responses? So, so, so the person who says, I, do, I can't do this liberty, like um, no, uh, maybe no iPhone for me. You know, like it's got me into trouble before and flip phone only. And that's their conviction. And, and, they, and to have an iPhone is just sin for them, even if it's used properly. And you're not to, and, and then they look at you and they say, how dare you have an iPhone? And you can sometimes feel that. You're like, you're not to despise them, the scripture says. If you have a believer that's a weaker believer, that has done, that, that connects something externally with just sin, although it in itself is not sin, and you feel that judgment from them, you're not to despise them, look down on them, like just grow up already. Be mature. But nor are they to look up with judgment. And so I could just say it to you. If there's somebody who has a stronger conviction or they're abstaining from something that you have a liberty to do, don't despise them. And if you have something that you really are convicted about and another Christian has liberty to do it, don't pass judgment on them. And the reason is because God has received them. That's what Paul says at the end of verse 3. The Lord's not going to, when, when he's sorting everything out, he's not going to ask for your help on how others did. He's going, God's going to receive them. And listen, why has God received them? Why has God received them? Why has God received the person who abstains? On the ba basis of their abstinence? No. On the basis of their, the gospel. And why, is the God, why has God received the person who has liberty? On the basis that they practice their liberties? No. On the basis of the gospel. Ephesians 1, 5, and 6 tells us that God has predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ uh, according to the good pleasure of his will, to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, and then to the praise of the glory of his grace, by what? By what? By which he made us accepted in the beloved. How are we accepted into the church, and accepted into the fold, accepted into the heavenlies, accepted into the beloved? By the gospel. And, and it tells us right there at the end of verse 4, or right, all of verse 4, let me read it to you. It says, and... It says, who are you to judge another servant? To his own master he stands or falls. And, and then I love it at the end of verse 4, Paul's so emphatic. Indeed, he will be made to stand. Why, why, why? Because God is able to make him stand. And for you Bible students, that word able, yes, it is dunamis. It's the same word as power, translated in Romans 1, 16. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God unto salvation. For everyone who believes. So how does God make people with differing convictions about how they live out their life and worship stand? On the basis of their convictions? No. But on the basis of the gospel. And how will I be able to stand on that final day? By my life choices that I have made on what I'm going to do with this liberty or not? Or, on the, or, or am I going to stand on the basis of what Jesus has done for me by dying on the cross, rising again, and ascending to heaven 
That's how I will stand. That's how you will stand. That's how God is able to make us stand. And so there's freedom in our worship because we've been set free to worship. And we are free to express our worship through abstinence of some things and through liberty and enjoying other things as we do it as unto the Lord with Godward thinking. Not careless thinking, but Lord, this is why I do what I do when I worship you. And so we, we worship him. And, and as we get into this next stretch of verses from verses five through nine, we realize this is one of the reasons the problem exists. It's because God receives us as we worship differently. Listen to the God word motion of verses five and six. Hear the God word worship. Verse five says, for one person esteems one day above another, another esteems every day alike. Let each be fully convinced in his own mind. And, and this is what Paul's saying is happening there in verse six. For he who observes the day, observes it to the Lord. And he who does not observe the day, to the Lord, he does not observe it. And he who eats, eats to the Lord. And for he gives God thanks for his food. And he who does not eat to the Lord, he does not eat. And he gives God thanks. So here you have a Jew who's just been saved and is like, I've kept the Sabbath my whole life. I'm going to worship the Lord on the Sabbath. And so why is he worshiping the Lord? Or why is he worshiping on the Sabbath day, Saturday? Because So unto the Lord. And does the Lord meet him? Yes. And his worship is full and awesome on Saturday. And he's thinking worshiping on Saturday is awesome. Everybody should do it. But then the New Testament believer says, I'm not going to worship the Lord. So he's not observing Saturday, the Sabbath day, as unto the Lord. Out of a decided thought in his mind that Jesus is my Sabbath, he's fulfilled the Sabbath, and now I worship on the first day of the week, Sunday, the day that Christ rose. But it's Saturday, and I'm not going to synagogue on Saturday because of my relationship with the Lord. Out of worship to the Lord, I'm not going to worship on Saturday. And the Lord blesses him with a rest-filled, worshipful Saturday and a worshipful Sunday. Because he's thinking of the Lord. And now somebody says, I'm going to fast or I'm going to abstain for this or I'm not eating, eating that food for the Lord. And the Lord says, you're abstaining uh, from that food for me. Well, I'm better than bread anyway. And your heart is filled with like, yeah, I've just learned that man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And the Lord meets with full and rich blessing the man who abstains. But then somebody else shares in that liberty. And before they eat that thing that that other man's abstaining from, they say, Lord, thank you. Blessed are are you, O Lord, God of the universe. You bring forth fruit from the vine and field from the earth, food from the earth. And I bless you and I thank you for this food that I'm going to eat. And the Lord fills their heart with joy and gladness as they eat their food with simplicity of heart and thankfulness to the Lord. And the person who abstains says, everybody should abstain. It's awesome. And the person who eats says, everybody should eat with this kind of joy. It's awesome. And you'd say, Lord, what? like, who did you love more? Like, like, and the Lord's like, it's neither. It's the heart. It's like dad opening gifts on Father's Day. And the one child brings, buys, had bought him some chocolate, favorite child. Oh, thank you. This is my favorite chocolate. How did you, you knew that about me. I'm so thankful. And you used some of your lawn mowing money to buy it. Thank you, son. I love you for the chocolate. Thank you for it. But then the daughter brings a homemade card. Oh, sweetie, this is so wonderful. He spent all the detail, the time you took. And those kids can kind of look at each other. Like, dad, would you rather have had me buy something than make the card or or would you rather have me make something than just buy something? And, and the, that dad can't answer that question. <laughs> For in gift giving, we say what? It's the thought that counts. And like, Lord, did you love his hand, high, hands held high worship more than my worship with my hands by my side? And the Lord can't answer that. <laughs> Because in, in our worship and our service to him, it's a matter of the heart. And when the Lord pours out his blessing because of your heartfelt worship, 
we have a tendency to think that it's because of the way that I worshipped that he met me, not because I worshipped. And so it is that the Lord says, let's not be rubberneckers. Let's worship the Lord, and he receives our worship. How gracious is he? For if the Lord were to mark iniquities, which one of us could stand? But by the blood that he shed for us, our guilt is forgiven, our sin is forgiven, our shame is removed, and he allows us not only to worship in song, but to worship with our lives, to worship by enjoying liberties that he's provided and and to worship by abstaining from some. And all of it is just unto him. Because verse 7 says, if you're alive, it's because the Lord's holding your breath in his hand. For none of us lives to himself and no one dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. Even our, our times are in his hand. Much, much more every season, much more worship, you know. Verse 9, for to this end Christ died and rose and lived again that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. Paul says here, let every person be fully convinced in his own mind. So yes, scripture helps us back our daily living. Should we think through our our daily lives of what I should eat or what I should drink or what I should put on? Yes, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Have scripture of why you do what you do, why you homeschool your kids or why you send them to the public school or, or why you do what you do, why you vacation where you vacation and you have your life discharged in his presence and you can be fully convinced that this thing that you're doing is for him. But please, if you're gonna be fully convinced about any one thing, be fully convinced about the gospel. That what Jesus did for you on the cross is sufficient to pay for your sin. Romans 4, 21 through 22, Paul said, being fully convinced that what he had promised, he was also able to perform. That's what Abraham was, was fully convinced of, that God was able to work in him and therefore it was accounted to him for righteousness. And so let us not, let us not judge one another The next verse says, but why do you judge your brother? Or why do you show contempt for your brother? Why do you look down on him? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. We don't want to look down on others. Do you remember there was that time that Mary took the alabaster flask of fragrant, costly oil the week that Jesus was going to be crucified and she broke it open. And she poured it on him. And some of the disciples began to look down on her, especially Judas. And they said, why was this money not sold? Or this, why was this oil not sold and the money given to the poor? Her worship of the Lord criticized. And Jesus said in Mark 14, 6, let her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a good work for me. You see somebody worshiping the Lord in a way that is, well, not the way you do it. I wonder how the Lord receives it. But can I say something very positive to you right now? Don't beat yourself up for the way that you worship. For if it's done from a heart of adoration and thankfulness and gratitude to the Lord, it's received. You don't have to look side to side to get your cues. Well, if I just did a little more like that or worshiped a little bit more, abstained a little bit more, had a few more liberties, if I was a little bit more like this guy, the Lord would receive me a little bit more. He could never receive you any more than he receives you in the finished work of Christ. And you worship him and you worship him freely and you worship him with the heart that he's given you to worship him with and the convictions that he's placed on your heart. You pour your heart out and your life out and worship to him. And so it is that we take heed to ourselves in this matter. We take heed of how we should worship. And although we might not hold others to this, we operate freely in it ourselves. 
And so verse 11, or right at the end of verse 10, it says, for we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Our son Stephen was a little comical at times. He was five and a half before Isaac and Anna were born. So he was an only child for five and a half years. And he never forgot it. I think one time when he was like 17, the kids were away, Isaac and Anna were away, and it's just Stephen and us. And he said, he's like, oh, wasn't it great just to be the three of us again? <laughs> he never forgot it. As Isaac and Anna were getting a little older and turning out well, and by the grace of God, he, one time Stephen looked at Cheryl and I and he said, you know what? We've done a really good job with these two. <laughs> I said, you had nothing to do with it. We will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ and Ted. No, right? <laughs> Put your name there. Everybody's going to give an account of themselves to God and God alone. So on one hand, that's freeing. You don't live in the court of public opinion. But on the other hand, that's fearful. Because you can fool some people. But you'll never fool the Lord. And so that's how you discharge your life. Not so what others think of you. But for what the Lord knows of you. And 2 Corinthians 5.10 says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. That's the Bema seat. That would have been the, the tiered Olympian reward place. That's not the great white throne judgment where our sins are judged. Those were judged by Christ. But the Bible says that all Christians will one day go to an award ceremony where they'll be crowned for the good things that they've done. And the Lord will reward them. And if you even give so much of a, a cup of cold water, the Lord will reward you. But to be sure, the way that you conduct your life and your liberties and your worship will one day be measured out before the Lord. 1 Corinthians 3, 12 through 15 says, Now if anyone builds on this foundation, that's the foundation of the gospel of Jesus, with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or straw, and some, you know, the fire's going to test it. Wood, the wood, hay, and straw is going to go away. Gold, silver, precious stones going to endure the fire. Each one's work will become clear and for the day will declare it because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. And if anyone, anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. But if your work is burned, you're just doing it for others to see you or, or you're not giving any attention to your daily living God word, but it's just man word, well, then you'll suffer loss. You won't lose your salvation. He himself will be saved. But yet as though through fire, just it's all going to be tested. And so that's where we need freedom in our worship, freedom to really worship the Lord with the consciences that he's given us and the way that he's called us. It's not a game. We're not keeping up with the Joneses. We're not impressing anybody. We're just serving the Lord. And we'll be rewarded by the Lord. Because Hebrews 6.10 says, For God is not unjust to forget your work and your labor of love which you've shown toward his name and that you've ministered to the saints and do minister, You're still doing it. Keep doing it. So Paul then said, as I live, says the Lord, in verse 11, for it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. In verse 12, so then each of us shall give an account of himself to the Lord. That's where it's gonna end, folks. <laughs> One day we're gonna give an account of ourselves to him. And so then verse 13 is a segue into next week's portion. In fact, a lot of Bible translations and some of the old manuscripts have this. Verse 13 is a beginning of the paragraph that then comes after. And so we'll look at it in detail next week. Verse 13, we'll pick right back up. But let me just read it one more time. Is it in the New King James that completes this section? Therefore, and this kind of the grand concluding thought, let us not judge one another. And that's, that's a conclusion from from today's passage, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather resolve this. Now, this looks forward to next week. Not to put a stumbling block or cause to fall in our brother's way. So if the immature believer abstains because of a hang-up, the mature believer freely partakes because of his maturity in the gospel. The maturer, can I say that? M believer 
abstains often for the sake of the weaker one. Okay? And we'll talk about that. Today, free to worship. Next week, free to serve or free to love others by letting your liberty be judged by their conscience that your freedom ends where their nose begins. (laughs) And out of love, you would care for them. That's the whole second half to this. We'll do that next week. Father, thank you for your word this morning. I pray for any that have never received you as Savior and Lord. Jesus, would you right now remind them that you died for them and rose again? If you're with us today and you've never asked Jesus to forgive your sin, come into your heart. I want to give you opportunity to do that right now. And come into his family. Jesus, forgive me. I believe you died for me. You love me. You rose again to give me life. And I want to live my life for you now. And if you pray that and surrender your heart to him in humility, he'll make you brand new. But for all of us as Christians, old and young, rich and poor, male and female, varying backgrounds and persuasions, convictions and and, uh, liberties, Lord, let us dwell together as one big happy family, worshiping you and not imposing our worship on others, but just worshiping you freely. So set us free to worship because we're received by the gospel, we pray. And we love you, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen.